Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back. Uh, Cody Cody looks different today if you're watching us on YouTube. He's got a, a little less hair and a little... The beard is a little fuller. Uh, Cody did indeed have his baby, so we, we wish him all well. The update is uh, that he has a, a healthy young girl, he and his wife and everybody doing happy. Um, so when we can get him back in the mix, we will certainly welcome him back and love to have him back. But someone else needs to sit in this chair, Dave, because uh, I cannot speak to myself all the time. I, you know, There's only so much solo basketball talk a man can have when he's brushing his teeth and recording himself on the internet and things like that. So Dave DeFore, our old friend, thanks for stopping by and, and uh, chopping it up today and talking some, talking some hoops. Yeah, I'm excited, and luckily it was the Knicks who I've watched a lot of uh, lately because um, I'm not sure if I would have had time to do a deep dive on just about any other team. The Knicks have just been fascinating to me lately, and uh, our world's kind of collided here perfectly. Well, it's we should great. thank we should thank the Knicks for being very hot. Thank Cody for having a baby <laughs> right after I watched all the Knicks. Well, you know, Cody's not here <laughs> for this announcement, but the, the Knicks are one of the hottest teams in the league. I think the Cavs, if you go to our um, team leaderboard on patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball over on thinkingbasketball.net, I think the Cavs have the best net rating in the league in the last month. So they're on fire. We're going to talk about them at some point. The Knicks have the second best net rating in the month. There's all these teams that are hot. We talked about the Jazz and their 17-4 and four stretch and things like that. And Dave, I have an announcement right here to start this show. Let's get, let's get it serious. Let's come on. Let's buckle in. Okay. The Clippers. The Clippers. I, I've seen enough, Dave. I am moving the Clippers into my inner circle of title contenders. There you They're go. In. That's a good call. That's a good call. You know, this has been a big topic of conversation for, for me and, and Seth and Mo over on Nerder is that this Clippers team, it, it's honestly, it's the most complete Clippers team of the Kawhi. PG era. And it's funny that James Harden really completed the puzzle for <laughs> yes, them, right? Yes. Because you wouldn't think that's the guy, but they now have so many guys that can get you a bucket and it, it slid everyone down a notch. Norm Powell has been fantastic playing with Russell Westbrook. And Russell Westbrook, number one, one of the more entertaining guys in the league this season since he went to the bench. I don't know how much you're into Russ, but uh, Russ doing stuff is fun to me. They have... They have five guys that can get you a bucket. They have four guys that can just go guard a guy. Amir Coffey is looking like a, a high level rotation guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Wild. And and Zoo's not even out there right now, which may work in their benefit. I mean, Zoo's getting like a nice chunk of time off here. <sighs> here here's the Westbrook stat for me: twenty minutes a game in the last two months. And in the last two months, the Clippers are like twenty-one and four, or twenty-seven and seven since he moved to the bench. Yeah, and they are third in net rating in that time. Uh, you know, this is NBA.com stats, not thinking basketball. So I think when you, uh, I think when you factor in like him buying in on the bench, that role he plays, where he's just coming in, instant energy. It is fitting with Powell. Powell, of course, can take the pressure that he makes downhill, collapse the defense, attack a closeout, hit a three. Now you got six guy, seventh guy, eighth guy off the bench contributing like that. I give them a ton of credit. I give Ty Lue a ton of credit. I give everybody a ton of credit there for making the changes, playing faster, uh, finding sets that work for everyone. We talked about James Harden's passing last week and and how that's really kind of organized the offense. But it's a big deal around these parts because at the beginning of the season, I made a video. It was about super teams. I'm fascinated with super teams. And the, you got the Bucks, and you got the Clippers, and you got the Suns. And over the years, there are all these super teams that don't quite work. And the thrust of that for me, Dave, was like looking at where they were and going, well, yeah, they're going to get better. But a 48 or 51 win team at the end of the year is not – like what we're talking about when we talk about an elite team. And uh, I think, th to me, they're in there with the Celtics and the Nuggets. I don't think there's anyone else I'd have in that inner circle. That's that's my big update lately. Yeah, those are my three. Um, and, and we just saw, I mean, you saw what the Clippers did to the Celtics the other night. I mean, I, I haven't seen the Celtics handled like that all year. 
Did you see that um, game? I did. Yeah. What What was your big takeaway? I think the Celtics uh, didn't have Porzingis, right? They didn't have Porzingis, but yeah. but the physicality of the Clippers, which is not like you wouldn't naturally think of that, but they are just so much more physical. Um, in that game in particular, I felt like they were they were extremely physical, and, and Boston just didn't respond to it. I, it. That's a game that's just as much about the Clippers as it is about the Celtics for me. I've got big issues with the Celtics, and you know against some of these high level defenses, especially in the half court. I don't trust their offense. They tend to, you know, do the Celtics thing at the especially down the stretch. But the Clippers are just they're just stronger. Like I, they make other teams feel them. And then Kawhi Leonard is. <laughs> he's he's pretty good. I he could be the best player in any single series against any team, and I put the Nuggets in there too. Mm. It's now, look, Jokic is the best player in the world, but Kawhi just looks so good right now. Well, it's fitting you're here for this as well because you have been a president and member of the Paul George fan club in the past, <laughs> and, and yeah. Paul Paul George is uh, he's been playing quite well, and the, the whole thing the whole thing fits pretty well. Yeah, I mean. I, I, it, the holes in this team are hard to find. Okay, and they're I, not a perfect team. I mean, they've got some holes, but they're hard to find. They cover them up pretty well. Can I go and, back? And Daniel Tice, who I did not like, uh, Daniel Tice is not who I would call a good player. He is a perfect third big for them. Like, it, it just it, he has been really, really good when he was filling in for Plumley while he was out. He was good. Lucky they have him while Zubac is out, and he's worked well in their defensive sk- uh, system. He's moving really well. Yeah, this this seems very good. Sorry. No, I just wanted to go back to what you said about the Celtics because my question that I just thought of as you were talking through this is do you think they get too much flack? I mean, I'm with you in that there there are things about their offensive process mm-hmm. that are a touch concerning. Um, we've talked about the drive and kick carousel for, you know, sometimes drive, kick, drive, kick, drive, kick. Uh, but I feel like sometimes they get too much flack because – that style also lends itself to a little more variance where you're taking 40, 45 threes a game. And against the Clippers, I think they were 10 of 40. So they have a really bad shooting night. So you get some shooting luck. And I know it's tough to internalize, even though we talk about it and nerd out on it in podcasts in 2024. But like the difference between 14 of 40 in a game like that and 10 of 40 is the difference between checking in and going, man, they got thumped and being like, oh, good job. The Clippers won a close road game. Like, good. And the Celtics didn't have Porzingis. So maybe the Celtics are actually much better. Like, it's that psychological factor. Do you think they get too much flack? No. No. Because, listen, it's a make or miss league, right? They're not good enough at shooting overall, in my opinion, to to shoot 45 threes a game. Mm. I understand, like, there's a volume component here. Look, when I coached high school basketball and coached on an awful team, we shot a ton of threes because I was just like, hey, we need some luck. If we can shoot 20% on threes and we attempt 40 a game, we're doing great compared to how we would do in our half court. And maybe that's just how Boston feels because when, frankly, like, like you said, driving kick, driving kick, driving kick, driving kick, late shot clock, Jason Tatum spraying up a prayer that's going to hit on the backboard. I mean, he has some of the worst misses that you ever see. I, I mean, I just wish that they had a functional half court offense where guys um, made plays for other dudes. There's a lot of isolation, and it's it's funny that we're talking about them right after the Clippers because the Clippers have isolation players I trust, and Boston doesn't. Yeah, I mean, except the, for Derek White, as, as an isolation player. Yeah, no, not really. Uh, pick and roll, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Tatum certainly gets the brunt of those possessions. Mm-hmm. I feel like, but the rest of the team isn't like Porzingis isn't wired like that. White isn't wired mm-hmm. like that. Drew Holiday isn't wired like that. And then Brown, I think, has some of that. But of course, when you he's bad at it. Well, yeah, when you add in turnovers and passing, um, I don't know how bad he is relative to like the other 500 players in the league, but relative to the other good isolation players, I, I think that more becomes the issue. Whereas the Clippers, when you look at Paul George. When you look at uh, Kawhi, as you mentioned, and then even Jimmy and I mean, I don't know where Russ's numbers are, but even in bench units, like he can at least take an isolation matchup and get into the paint and create some havoc that way. So they they are a little different in that sense, just in terms of the floor of your offensive possessions when you have to fall back on isolation. Yeah, I I just 
oops, excuse me. Uh, the Celtics just, it, it, again, this is years, years of this. It's years of this. Like at a certain point, I mean, this is the third coach that's kind of dealt with similar issues. You know, their, their half court problems are, are not anything new. Um, it just feels like they they don't have butter plays. You know what I mean? Like they don't have those those money plays, the, the things that they can go to. I'm going to get a bucket out of this on an easy look. They have some plays that run into like contested fadeaways, contested mid-range. I don't love them, um, but I at least like those better than Jason Tatum gets the ball at the wing, jab step 17 times, takes a step back, clanker. I just, I can't watch that much. But more. see, this is where I think we are a little unfair to them because like Kawhi Leonard, he is top 10. If you were to look at like isolation possessions and the team offense on those possessions, uh, there's only, I think something like 60 players in the league off the top of my head who have had a hundred isolation possessions this year. Kawhi's top 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Kawhi, we know is fantastic at that, yeah. at, at floor raising those, but Paul George and Tatum are like right next to each other. Uh, and they're both, you know, above average or, or comfortably above average. So I feel like I don't know if it's his style or the fact that he's not as fluid or the fact that the Celtics are under such a microscope where where they have that thing, which is kind of what I'm getting at, where it's like, oh, the Celtics lost a game. Is the sky falling? And it's like, well, they have, they have had the best record in the league for like two years. So the sky's probably not falling. They just lose games sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but this is the uh, this is like the. It's the bigotry of high expectations, mm. right? This team is elite. They are elite. They're the best team. I think they're head and shoulders above everybody else in the East. I mean, as we said, there's no other Eastern team that I can put in the conversation. So we are putting them under a microscope. You know, we know what their flaws are. We, we, we know the changes that they made. I think this is sort of par for the course. They're at that stage that Denver was at before they win the title. You know, uh, Denver, we pat them on the head when they did well. And then it was, OK, now do it in the playoffs. And we said that for a long time. And then we start saying, OK, what happens when you get late game and you're playing defense? Can you pull Jokic? Can you afford to do that? And then they made that change. Right. I, th I think with Boston, this is sort of how it goes. The difference is that Boston has been at such a high level, like, you know, finals or sub finals for years now. I mean, this is a a testament to Jason Tatum and how good he's been, but you got to win a title. And so now that's until they win a title, we get to say, Oh man, but they don't do this thing. This is going to keep them from winning a title. But maybe that's it's the analysis point. is how it works. Right? Well, yeah, We're poking maybe, holes. maybe that's the point. Maybe Den Denver had too much flack until they won a title with exactly that point about like, you would see the comments, you know, they can't win a title because Jokic is going to get exposed in the playoffs and the context of the previous two years, didn't support that. The Warriors the year before, it's like, oh, Durant's gone and this, you know, Curry's going to get attacked and all this other stuff. And it's like, nope, that's not right. So I just feel like we can't always be reactionary. And sure, the Celtics are not a perfect team, but uh, I don't think it, I don't think it prevents them from winning four rounds. It's more narration than reaction, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's more like, the, here's the story. And I mean, it's not just the Clippers game. The, the, for the for the third or fourth year in a row, I'm pretty sure there are multiple stories about late game issues with the Celtics offense. I mean, you you can just put it into Google and and you'll see 2019, 2020, 2021. Every spring, this the stories come out, right? You can you can put anything into Google these days, Dave. Of course, yeah, and, that's true. Just be Over careful. Over half the internet yeah. now is uh, is just automatically <laughs> generated. Proceed. As a matter of fact, I, I think I've already pre-written this article two years from now for the Celtics. Proceed with caution when you uh, enter things. Okay, but yeah, it's more narrative than it is reaction. I, narration is the 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 thing. It's this is the stuff I want to see them clean up. Over the course of the rest of the season, I still think they're figuring out how to how to fully use Porzingis on offense. I mean, that guy is a super unique tool, and and I do think when, I mean, Tatum and Porzingis have been pretty good together, but I think as they get even more time under their belt, and especially come playoff time, I think that by the second round of the playoffs, when they've been playing higher minutes together, we're going to see even better chemistry. Porzingis is really like an interesting partner for Tatum. Solves a lot of his issues. Let's talk about the Knicks. Yeah. Last month, New York, plus 12 net rating. 
Second best net rating in the league in the last month. Smoking hot since the OG Ananobi trade. I, I think his on court, you know, plus minus. It was like plus 48 or something <laughs> the other day. I mean, it, it's been absurd. This guy is on a run, man. Is OG Ananobi actually the best player in the league? <laughs> I mean, if you were to only look at that stat and uh, if an alien came down and you had to explain it, it you know, Maybe we should try to explain that today. Maybe we should try yeah, to explain we should. just how good he is. Um, just for the record, OG Ananobi with the Knicks has played exactly 500 minutes as of recording this. They are plus 25 per 100 with him on the court. Plus 25. They have a 125 offensive rating, Dave, and the defensive rating is 100. Like it's, like it's 2004 in Madison Square Garden. 100 points per 100 possessions. Some of that might be opponent and luck, but... Well, sure. Yeah, go ahead. He's, he, yeah, make it's your basketball. MV, make your MVP case. <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, if we're only judging it. him yeah. on, on you know how he's done in New York, um, honestly, he's kind of a perfect fit for this roster. I mean, I, I, I texted you about this, and when they made the trade, this was sort of my overwhelming feel, feeling about the Knicks, is that they're now one guy away. Now it's a big guy. Don't get me wrong. Like they need a number one. It's like getting Joel Embiid, for instance, um, or Victor Wembanyama, or someone like that. I, I think that that they're missing that a one piece for a title team. Uh, but OG is uh, he, he's like it's not a utility player because he's too good to be a utility player, but utility player in the sense that you are going to find a way to have him in high leverage moments, no matter who else is on the court for your team. So let's say, you know, you've got a few guys at hot hand, okay? And we don't, we can't sit these guys. He can play with three guard lineups as the four. He can play some five. And and just having that sort of flexibility, his strength, his toughness. And Tom Thibodeau has, I think pretty obviously, given him a lot of freedom. Um, you know, we, we were going through some clips before the show and, and you put together a really nice OG package. Especially the stuff where he tags a cutter uh, off the ball. You know, he leaves his man in the corner on this one play that I watched, and he tags the cutter from the wing and still recovers to be able to make a steal. Now, part of that is length, but it's also instincts. Like, he is just seeing everything. He sees the ball, he sees the cutter, and he's so physical that when he gets in there and drops his shoulder, it's over. That pass is no longer available. And somehow, you know, what's his wingspan? Because a lot, I, I hadn't, I yeah. and I know he's long, but you don't really like. I, I don't think in Toronto it stood out as much. Maybe because everyone there is like six nine, six ten, and with the Knicks you have so many small guards when he's on the court. I think he measured but, like over seven feet in wingspan. It wouldn't, so that's what you're picking up. Yeah, you know? it wouldn't surprise me. But he he uses his full length when he's playing defense, and a lot of guys don't. I mean, alligator arms are a real thing. I mean. And OG somehow just – he uses all of his length at every – not just for steals. He also uses it for defending space too and, and, and making passes hard to make. The thing the – thir- the first thing that jumps out, and they talked about this a lot in Toronto, but he, he's truly a player that matches up one through five. So Thibodeau is deploying him on Jimmy Butler in one game. And, you know, Jimmy Butler's like having a hard time – getting by him and then the next game he's guarding Jamal Murray the the point guard head of the snake on the perimeter for the Nuggets and he's doing a good job there then another game he's matched up with Paolo Boncaro or Carl Anthony Towns there's one possession in the Philly game a couple weeks ago where he's matched up with Maxi. that's his primary chasing Maxi around the floor chasing this little guard around the court and look he can't do a perfect job of chasing someone that quick. Like when we say he guards one through five, he's not elite necessarily at every position, but he can do no. a pretty good job. And then there's one possession where he's guarding Maxi, um, switches mid possession to Embiid and guards Embiid in isolation at the elbow and does a good job there. To be able to guard both those guys in the same possession uh, is, is super impressive. So that versatility allows New York to go into every game and just like decide where they're going to deploy him on the best offensive weapon another team has and everything can trickle downhill from there. 
They've also, I, I think, wa- been one of the better switching teams in that they don't just give up a switch every time, and they're smart about when they switch. And OG has unlocked that for them because of his switchability. I mean, uh, the, like if Josh Hart's on the point of attack guy, like if he's guarding the point guard and and gets caught on a screen, OG can switch that, and they didn't have that before at the three or four, in my opinion. Um, a guy who can play contain, he can play center field, and he, you can also double with him. Um, he just he again he just opens up so much for them defensively, and, and it allows their I think it allows their bigs to be more active and aggressive uh, in their help roles. Also, I mean this is just there's a reason why OG Ananobi was was like a player that I wanted to see moved. I wanted to see what would happen if he was on a pretty good team versus a team that was just clearly going nowhere. Like, what does it look like when you have a creative defensive coach deploying this guy? Tom Thibodeau's having a good time with him, I think. Yeah, I mean, he got he got a lot of shine uh, when he was in Toronto, but mm-hmm. as you mentioned earlier, like, maybe lost in the shuffle a little bit because every Toronto Raptor was 6'6 with a 7-foot wingspan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and now you get to see on a team, let's go back to the idea of not switching a lot. He can chase all these players around screens he can push them into the paint and now you've got Isaiah Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson and whoever's there for length protecting the basket Um, it all kind of works together because you can play that drop coverage push guys into the paint or you can switch late if you need to switch late or something like that and and get a good possession that way he's got good hands you mentioned he can make plays at at the nail. When, he, when he's in 54 defense, you know, when he's the four man and coming over to double on the on the low block, like, I mean, again, that length, that strength, that size, I mean, it's just, it allows him to play faster too, because when he's the four man, I, I just feel like the ball doesn't stick as much as with some other options that they have at the four. Um, so I think the defense into offense even becomes a little bit more, more powerful with, with, with OG there, especially when he's at the four. Yeah, let, let's talk about the offense because it's pretty fascinating to me. You you have a player uh, who doesn't need possessions run for him ever, right? So the low-hanging fruit is that he's a really good corner three guy. Um, very high percentages from the corner. So hanging out below the break and hitting threes. But then he attacks closeouts well. And it goes back to that strength, right? He uses his strengths on both sides of the ball. So when he's attacking a closeout, um, it's not that he's Anthony Edwards. It's not that he's uh, Giannis. It's not that he's the most destructive downhill force. But he's so big when he gets space to charge into that he can use that power and he can finish that way. I'm kind of fascinated by the Knicks specifically will run a corner screen handoff action for him. And... To his credit, he won't attack if it's not there. But if it is there, he hits the space super hard like a fullback, gets downhill, and can finish. Or the other thing he can do when he's like attacking closeouts like that is make a good extra pass. And all that connective tissue stuff just helps when you're not the primary guy on an offense. Um, Yeah, it's it's just a really good fit, obviously. He's an excellent continuation player. He doesn't stop. And this is why, I mean, he's a, he's a good cog for a good team, but he's a, a, an advanced cog, I think. I don't think he can be your second best player, but as your third best player, wow. You know, I mean, it's um, Chris Middleton level, in my opinion, as far Ooh. as like quality Ooh. of player. You think he's that good? I do. Yeah, I mean, I think OG, again, I, I also think it's hard to, it's been hard to judge OG based on Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I think he uses that physicality, by the way, on defense as well against those small guys. Like, he's so strong. He's Can you so... imagine him with a hand on your hip? That's what I'm saying. Look, he's so right. strong that when you start slowing down the tape, you notice the little, just the little hand or forearm that can reroute the driver without getting the whistle most of the time. And then he's, you know, obviously good enough to time up the contest with his length after he moves you off your line. So, um, all that is probably the reason why the Knicks have a 100 defensive rating <laughs> with him on the court in, in the last month. Yeah, it's really OG's hips that are that are very <laughs> impressive here. Is uh... <laughs> Dave? How do you feel about his shin angle? Oh, I, you know <laughs> what? It's okay. He, it's okay. He, like, yeah, I mean, he's fine. I, I wouldn't put him in that sort of elite 
athletic category. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, for, for so I saw some running back a couple weeks ago, man, and, and that was like Michael Jordan all over again with the shin angle on a cut. I think it was um, one of the guys for for Kansas City, but yeah. For those OG wondering, Dave have Dave loves Dave's nickname is Dave Shin Angle Dufour. Um, that that and the Danny Green bit, I think, are your maybe your two. Mo- yeah, it's been sad with listen, man. It's been sad with no Danny Green. Well, you at least have KCP. No, I'm not as I don't know, man. No, I'm, just, I, look, Manny Green. Manny Green is coming soon. That's all I got to say. Manny Green. I think he's in the class of uh, 2026. High level prospect, Manny Green. I'm gonna just do the handoff from Danny to Manny, <laughs> regardless of how he plays. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, let's circle back to something you said earlier, yeah. Dave. Because I, I want to know. I want to actually. The people want to know. I'm getting the messages now. I'm starting to get the messages. How good are the Knicks? Man, I think they're very good. I, I this is a top four in the East. I think you know they should be four or five, which is about where they are. Um, they're neck and neck with the Cavs to me. I have so I, I have the Bucks and Philly in like tier two in the East, and I yep. have Cavs Knicks. I mean, yep. and, and part of this is just what we've all seen. There's not not much different. I do think the Knicks have an opportunity to sneak into that second tier. I need to see more of this, right? Like if this is just who they are and what they're going to be. It, it's sad for me that Mitch Robinson is is out because it would slide Hartenstein back a little bit. And um, I think that they could have, uh, you know, 48 minutes of a very good center play. Um, and also those two sometimes playing together is is really interesting. I mean, I, I love offensive rebounding. So um, we, we got we got to talk about this offensive rebounding thing. The, the Knicks are first in the entire NBA in offensive rebounding percentage. Uh, before the show, I texted Dave. I said, Dave, why do you think the Knicks grab so many rebounds? Let's discuss it on the show. And he said they miss a lot of shots. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but no, they're first in percentage. No, they're they first are, in yeah. percentage. Um, and yeah, we, I, I have some thoughts on this after going through offensive rebounds that they they generate it's pretty interesting i know you have some thoughts as well i think the obvious place to start is that they have a lot of, a lot of good offensive rebounders right yeah like that's the obvious and, place and this is a skill by the way and um it's more than just effort I, a lot of people will, will it's sort of like defense like defense is a skill effort is also a skill that that helps you with defense and with rebounding but they are exclusive skills um, I do think that there are guys who just are, like Dennis Rodman has talked about this quite a bit. He watched his own teammates practice shooting. I think that that's a big part of being good at offensive rebounding. I think these guys are watching film. I think that they know the tendencies of their players uh, or their teammates missing. Whenever a shot's going up from the corner, the opposite corner is always crashing every single time without fail. They're disciplined on the offensive glass. Uh, we're going to get into this, but they're smart about using this, the duck in from the dunker, the sneak in from the baseline, and they apply pressure from from weird angles mm-hmm. and force the defense to adjust. And so a lot of these rebounds wind up coming right in the middle of the paint because they've just dragged the big under the basket or pushed him under the basket because something else that they're really good at is tagging the defensive rebounders as well. So this is how they're also limiting transition. So in offensive rebounding, you can you can get position and get a rebound, but that's actually bad position because in the NBA with the, the advent of the three-pointer, you have longer and longer right, rebounds. Right, yep. So you're going to give up more transition. So to counteract that, the modern strategy – it's called tagging, and it's when you come in and you essentially crash from behind. The goal is to push, either push these guys under the basket or push them under the rebound so that you can get a longer rebound yourself. But you're boxing them in, essentially, instead yep. of out. And so you're able to offensive rebound and also guard in transition. Now, this is like, this is how the Warriors won the title. A couple years ago, it was Looney and Wiggins and Draymond doing pretty much this exact same thing. Also, Looney having a Moses Malone like run. <laughs> Looney, Looney can move move worlds by himself when he does this. Um, He's just incredible. But but the Knicks are on top of just having guys who are talented at it. They are disciplined at it, which tells me that the coaches are hammering this every single game. They know they're. 
people think about defensive assignments, but they don't think enough about rebounding assignments and, and the importance of that. They, they'll they send two guards to a big to open up rebounds for their own bigs. I mean, this is just high-level advanced offensive rebounding and high effort. When those two come together and with good coaching, I mean, this is what we're seeing out of the Knicks. And come playoff time, these extra possessions are crucial. This is why I don't, you know, Doc Rivers going into Milwaukee is, I'm a little bit nervous because, you know, Doc does an offensive rebound. And that team absolutely should offensive rebound when you have Giannis and Brooke Lopez. So I'm curious to see how that works out because it's now an offensive rebound heavy league. And if you can't do it at an elite level, you're going to have a hard time competing come playoff time. I think the Knicks, this is a team that should feel like, it's a disappointing season if we don't make the conference finals because we're good. But they're ooh, definitely going to – they they should definitely get out of the first round of the playoffs. Okay. I, w- I want to get back to rebounding in the playoffs in a second. Um, but I'm just, I'm just loving – this is what we're here for, Dave. Offensive rebounding strategies – of the 21st century, we finally we finally tickled your. You got some vinegar in your loins right now. This is amazing. <laughs> so yes, this has been a thing at I can't remember where I first saw it. College, Europe, something like that. Um, just this concept of like if you're going to crash, you can kind of tag up and make sure that you have your transition matchups with the Knicks. As you mentioned, you have these guys like Dante Divincenzo. You have Josh Hart. They're just good perimeter crashing guys in general. And I think that along with the fact that they're cutters, that was the other thing that was jumping out to me watching the tape is those players organically want to cut. When you cut and the shot goes up, you're dragging bodies toward you as well. And then, man, how cool is that? Like, I don't know, there's a trade-off. Maybe maybe it hurts your spacing on the first shot. So maybe your first shot offense isn't that great. But they always, the, the big who sets a screen, they're not playing five out. He's not hanging out on the perimeter like Chris Stapps Porzingis. He's rolling and rooting himself under the basket. And when you start to watch their offensive rebounds, that's the thing that pops. Offensive rebounding, when you grab like 5% more offensive rebounds than the average team does, you don't need the best first chance offense. But the offensive right. rebounding is the thing that gets the Knicks into the top 10. And that segues us perfectly to the playoffs because my question is, do you think a team like this that I think we both agree they need another big offensive piece? That's the thing that's you know the difference between the Knicks team being very good and the Knicks team being a contender. Uh, we talked about the Clippers earlier jumping into the inner circle. Like Jalen Brunson is great. We can wax poetic in a minute. I would love to uh, about Jalen Brunson and how he's playing lately. But you get a guy like Julius Randle as your other primary. You get all these other players that are kind of connective tissue, secondary players. It's just not enough offensive firepower. We've seen that in the past. We saw that last year in the postseason. So how much in a playoff series, if you have a particular matchup against a team, can you rely on your offensive rebounding to basically like buoy your offensive rating so it doesn't crater in a playoff series? We've seen huge games. I think Mitchell Robinson, maybe in maybe the Cleveland series, he had just crazy dominant single game can you get that in a whole series if you get the right matchup? I mean, I, I th- it depends on the matchup. You know, if it's Milwaukee, good luck. Because they're huge. They're just too big. Yeah. And, and for this team in particular, for the Knicks, I think, you know, they might just be too small for that team. For Against Philly, it, it may be tough because Embiid is just, you know, so dominant. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I will say it is a little bit of a finger in the dike situation where you need it so badly because you have these flaws. Um, but they've baked it into their system. And so it's it's hard to tell until you get to the playoffs. But I, I typically I'm with you. I think that you if you're relying if you're over relying on offensive rebounds to generate good looks, which is part of what the Knicks do, you know, that the offensive rebound kick out three. It, it's just the it's the best shot in basketball right now. And they get those. So it, it's not something that you really want to rely on. But again, we, we've seen it work for teams. Um, I just don't know that they have the high end talent to, you know, to get over the hump. That's the tricky part. That's the tricky. That's part. always. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is, you know, it's the NBA. There's one team that gets over the hump there, every year, right? Well, yeah. No, there are they're, they're really good. The top. By the way, Aaron good. Fern is is the coach uh, that I know of 
who's talked about tagging up offensive rebounding systems. So if you guys are listening, you go and Google that. He's got you know some demonstrations on YouTube um, of that system. But Aaron Fern is the guy. So Couldn't this, think of the name right off the top of my head. I, th- I think this lands us in a, in a good place to, to wrap up the conversation. Jalen Brunson was not named an all-star. Uh, of course, we will do – we're going to try to get Cody back. We're going to get our sub-all-star team, our annual – I think it's like the sixth annual. I can't believe it might be the sixth annual sub-all-star team that we've done. We're going to do that in a couple weeks. Um, but – so so as you know, if you're a longtime listener, all-stars for us are not about the spots. They're about like the 28, 30 guys in the league that are playing at that level. Um, so, Dave, I'm less interested in the particular of – Like, did he deserve to have it over Lillard? Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. And more interested in this conversation we've been having about the quality of the team, what happens in the playoffs, who can they beat? Do you see enough improvement from Brunson this season over the last couple years to say like, yeah, I trust that dude to almost single-handedly get me enough offense to get to the conference finals, to win not just that first round 4-5 matchup, but to pull an upset that it looks like it's going to be required to get to the conference finals against a Philly, Milwaukee, Boston. Brunson, I want to say, is second in the league in time of possession. He has the ball like 46% of the time. So a very heliocentric system without necessarily being a, a 10 or 12 assist per game passer. Um, what, what are you seeing from him right now? What are your thoughts? Well, this, this is the issue. Um, high usage, not a great playmaker for other guys, right? Great for himself, can stir the drink and get open. And I mean, I he was excellent in the playoffs in spite uh the ankle injury last year. I mean, this guy, I think that is maybe a little bit forgotten. He was, you know, he, he got that ankle injury. And then we know how important being able to hit the mid-range is, and he's excellent at it. The issue is he's going to see a lot of doubles, and he needs to be able to give the ball up and then go, go make something happen. Um, Can you trust him to do that, you know, 40, 50 times again? I don't know. Yeah. We haven't seen it yet. Well, the playmaking thing is is a really interesting pivot point because I think he's actually, especially for his size, I think he's actually pretty good at going to the second side, throwing a skip pass, realizing I'm starting to cook, I'm getting in the middle of the paint, Oh, here comes help. I'm going to kick it to someone. And then the Knicks can get teams in rotation. And this is where a guy like OG is so helpful. Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, on and on and on. But, I mean, what did Miami do to him last year? They're just like, well, welcome to Double Team City. And you're a small guard. And we're going to put pressure and size on you on the ball. And for a lot of players, I think Brunson included, that means you're kind of looking for the outlet valve at the top of the key to reset instead of looking instead of the Jokic effect. And, right. Right. Getting instead into of, the offense. Yes. Can you get the ball to the wing, to the corner, to the, the, to and, the open spot, basically right. in the soft spot in the paint. Yeah. And honestly, it's one of the things where if they had Draymond green, for instance, you say, Oh, okay. Maybe OG can be this guy. I don't know if his handle is good enough, but maybe OG can be the guy that comes to the ball. You know what I mean? And is, 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 you're bringing his man as the as the doubler, so that OG can be your decision maker. I I, I don't know. Um, Randall for me is not the guy. Yep. Unfortunately, <laughs> because I actually the thing the thing is Randall is actually he's an entertaining player to watch, but he is infuriating because his talent is is incredibly high. But it seems like his ability to lift up his teammates is non-existent. And I, so that's kind of what you need in that. In that, like, Can we get Boris Diaw to come play with Jalen Brunson? You know, a guy that is just, how do, I, how do I keep the ball moving knowing I will eventually touch it again? J- you know, Randall, it's a feast or famine mindset for him, I think, when, when he's playing basketball. And when he touches it, it's like, ah, oh, I may never get it back. His, his shot selection leaves a lot to be desired to me. Um, a lot of quick early threes and long jumpers in the clock. And then this goes back to what we were saying about the construction of the team. They play a lot of isolation through him. That's more deliberate. That's more like, well, we don't have another guy, so mm-hmm. we're going to play this isolation. They actually get a good amount of offensive rebounds out of those sets because you know he 
kamikazes in there, crashes and we, misses. And You have to guard him with a big. Yep. Right? I mean, they're, he's they're, again, they're, they're playing into it. You have to guard him with a big. And when he's on the block, you've got to think about sending a double, even with a big on him. But the, the issue is when you send a double, he's not going to kill you with great passing. And then if you look at the overall makeup of their offense, I think the number, according to Second Spectrum, is Randall is third in the league in isolations this season in the entire NBA. But he's like in the bottom quartile in efficiency, the Knicks efficiency in those possessions. So you get a ton of isolation from him, but the possessions are not very efficient. I need to see the numbers on, I want the Knicks team offensive rebound rate on Randall misses. Yeah. Because is there a Julius Randall assist in here that we don't know about where they get the offensive rebound, it leads to a kick out and a bucket. I'm trying to get spin this in a positive light, you know, like the Kobe assist with the air balls. Well, but no, Randall I, bricks to kick outs. I think you're onto something in the sense that the Knicks don't always necessarily have something better. But right. at the same time, I also feel like when the Knicks are at their best, it's not that, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. This, this goes back to the last conversation Cody and I had about high primacy players and what happens when they're not effective or not efficient. Your instinct is to be like, well, I'm going to take the best high primacy player and rank him first, and then I'll just rank the next high primacy player who's very inefficient and struggles below that. And it's actually like a, it's a knife's edge. It's like a cliff you fall off. And it's like, <laughs> yes. actually, actually, if you're using up all the possessions and it's not very good... You could, and we've, I think we've seen this in the past, Randall can go off the floor and the Knicks can find these great rhythmic possessions. Defense turns into offense. They do a lot of defense to offense. They, they're a slow team because of all these isolations, because of the way both Brunson and Randall play in the half court. But when they push with pace or when they play a possession with pace in early offense, the OG gets downhill, Josh Hart gets downhill, Quentin Grimes gets downhill, then the ball starts spraying around the perimeter. I feel like that's kind of when they're at their best. I, I, I don't know. Do you do you buy into that? Anything anything that allows their guards to get two feet in the paint, anything anytime that happens, they have they have a that's a good possession for them. Any single time a guard can attack and get two feet into the paint, whether it's Jalen Brunson or anybody else, and, and including like DiVincenzo on a catch and go, right? Like just when they do that, they they have a tendency to find the shooters in the corners or. Their big slide over from the dunker. I mean, they they really – it's basic basketball. It's like old school style offense. Uh, but that's half court offense. That's their best possessions. And which is why – and I hate to say it because I get so sick of pick and roll. But a Jalen Brunson pick and roll is the best offensive option for them by such a large amount in, in, in my mind that I don't understand why Julius Randle gets the opportunities that he does. Well, when Brunson, Brunson's on the court. But the irony is Brunson already has the ball almost more than everyone else I in know. the league. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there's only so much you can you can go to that well and kind of tax the, tax the little fella. Well, everybody keeps saying that small guards, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. If small guards are tough. If Cody's listening, he's going to be he, – he needs a little Jalen Brunson juice. He needs it. We haven't done a Jalen Brunson hour. In a, we used to do him when he was in Dallas, Dave. We used to do J- Jalen Brunson hours all the time. Um, the well, fo- you know, hey, I, Jalen Brunson became a good player when I started saying he needed to shoot more threes. I've been taking credit for this okay, privately. So that's Well, <laughs> that's what I was going to land on. Um, you, you, the footwork master, playing off of two feet, getting into the paint. We know about that. That's been there for a couple of years. That's been there since Villanova, let's, 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 let's be honest. Uh, probably since he was like nine. Um, but the pull-up three-point shooting is a specific thing. My understanding is that Jalen made a concerted effort in the offseason to practice and ramp up the volume of the, this specific shot and the diet of these shots he would get in games. So that means a step back, but maybe more importantly, it means coming downhill in a pick and roll when you have that little pocket There's against a drop coverage, you have a little space. And what we've seen in the last year or two is we've seen an uptick. I mean, he's been incredibly successful at converting this into into on court success, so he used to be like one pull up three a game a couple years ago in Dallas mm-hmm. at like 31 percent. Not huge, not huge numbers, right? Sample yeah. wise, but even if you looked at his multi year numbers since he came into the league when he was in Dallas, he was always a low pull up three guy 
off the dribble, 30% low volume. Um, this year, he's up to four pull-up threes every 36 minutes. So he's like quadrupled his volume in the last couple seasons, and he's at 40%. And last year, he was at three at 38%. So he's been able to translate it. It's been, a, I think, a great case study of like, in the offseason, this is the exact thing I'm going to add to my game. Snap your fingers and just make it happen. It's, re- it's really easy, Dave, right? Just to be that good at NBA basketball. Uh, I mean, you know, it's probably easier, to be honest with you. It's it's all about uh, just taking the skill that works and just translating it to 10 feet further away. So you, um, so you think from the, from his mid-range success that... No, it's a totally different shot. I mean, yeah. especially for him, because small guards, as a small guard, I can speak to the small guards, like you really got to rise up in the mid-range and you don't want to rise up on your three because it's going to be inconsistent. Um, I think the biggest thing for him is he got stronger. Like he has gotten stronger, which for a guy who came out, I thought pretty pretty beefy. He's gotten stronger in his lower body. That helps with his range quite a bit. But it also goes to show you how few guys actually are adding stuff to their game over the summer. When you see a guy like Jalen Brunson have that sort of success, and this is a drastic change for him. But but it's I don't think it's that easy. That's the thing. Oh no, it's hard. Yeah. It's 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 really hard. I mean, you have you ever worked with players? Oh, and not in many years. Okay. No. Yeah. Players are creatures of habit too, just like the rest of us. They have their favorite spots on the court, just like we do. And they have their favorite way to get into stuff. Like there's a rhythm to basketball it, different than other sports. Right? Yes. Like, yes. This is my, this is my low key theorist theory of basketball. That's going to be in thinking basketball too in 2027 or something. Um, I think basketball is a super neurotic sport compared yeah. to other sports. You're, you're dribbling. You're repeatedly dribbling the ball at a rhythm. You know, when you're, we're kids, we're like, where are you going? We're like, I'm taking my ball and dribbling it everywhere I go. And then as someone it's myself, right, exactly. As someone myself, who's like a shooter, you get these, well, I got to, my footwork has to be exactly like this. I have to go, I have to take these shots on this part of the court. I have to do my free throw routine. I have to end on X number of makes. I can't end on the, like, it just becomes more and more neurotic. Other sports don't necessarily have that, especially when okay. you practice and train in them. Yeah. And Ray Allen was known for this, but the truth is like JJ Redick, any, any, any professional shooter, the routine is yeah. absolutely into their routine because the stuff matters so much. Uh, basketball is all rhythm and feel at the at the at the far end of the spectrum, right? Like so, when you're at the top, the very top, let's say it's all like the NBA skill. Let's say skill is the difference between the top skill and the bottom skill is different than like difference between LeBron James and someone who's never played basketball. It's so much closer, right? But that touch and feel is a huge differentiator. You can have guys who are NBA athletes, NBA basketball players, but don't have the elite touch and feel. And then you have other guys who aren't elite athletes, but have elite touch and feel and rhythm and just know the game. And like, this is why I love basketball. It's, it's, it's an art as much as a sport. And the stuff, like you can be amazing as an athlete, but you can also be amazing as an artist and, and, and be recognized for it. But that, that touch, feel, and, and being able to spend a summer building new rhythm at game speed too. This is the other thing because practice in basketball is nothing, nothing like practice, like, like a real game. You cannot simulate it. The speed is so different. The, the bodies move different. I mean, it's just, so for him to, to come out of the gym and it, maybe the world cup helped him, but for him to come out of the gym uh, in one summer and, and to make that sort of a drastic change, I, and that's like DeMar DeRozan when he didn't have a left hand and he came back and was just like, oh, I'm now a master of the left hand after one one summer. It, it also makes me wonder if there's a certain type of player that uh, cognitively, athletically, is able to add certain skills. So it's like, think about Brunson's footwork package and the way he toys with bigger people and the way he's been doing that since he was, you know, 13 14 15 years old whatever it is and then does that somehow make it easier for him to learn a skill like get the footwork get organized and to your point maybe you just need to strengthen the reps and now you've got to pull up three because at least for him I, I I was a big fan of him coming out of Villanova I thought he'd be a really good NBA player I thought he was a sleeper but there's a difference between like a fringe all-star and 
leave aside the defensive warts because he's a small guard. Like offensively, he's one of the best offensive players in the league. He's really, really good. The Knicks offense is seven points per 100 better when he's on the court. They have a good offense when he's on the court. Um, not not a perfect offensive player, but he's just what a fantastic what a to your to use your word an artist out yeah. there just having to paint the court with buckets everywhere he goes. I wonder I wonder if he's a really good film guy. Like I wonder if he's just you show him something on film and he locks it in because it takes. It's, there's no way he had enough time just in the gym to improve this. He had to be watching his own film and, and practicing. And, and, you know, there there are people where you can literally do this. Don't do this. Do this. And then they just lock it in. And he might be one of those guys. Maybe he's a savant. And we just didn't know it because he was a short, small guard. And, um, you know, we're overlooked. I <laughs> I I kind of also wonder about this generation and just like how many more players in this generation we just had the video on younger players playing this more cerebral that's what that's what led me to do this video just noticing all these sort of non superstar prospects at a very young age approaching the game with a more st- cerebral regimented like tactical this is how I attack this this is how I get a close out this is how I play this defensive possession at 20 21 years old um I think it was Franz Wagner on the JJ Redick podcast recently talking about how he loves to dip into second spectrum footage of like his game and what's happening after the game like is this just a generational thing with with younger that players that sounds like that sounds like pandering to me, but I would say this is the most well-coached generation of basketball players ever. Who, who's who's, who's pandering in that situation? I think Franz is kind of pandering to you know people listening to JJ Reddick's podcast. But so you don't hey, think he, you like, don't think I'm he likes I'm just like it. you. Yeah. I'm looking. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. No, I'm just. Teasing. Yes, you are. You're on the record. We <laughs> yeah. Send 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 Franz messages. Franz Wagner today. is a liar. No. Uh, <laughs> But I, I do. I, I just think that this is the most well coached generation of players as well, right? Like coaching has gotten so much better. Um, the NBA just think about it, man. There's so well. I guess this is a bad week to be saying this, but there's so few bums coaching in the NBA. There's few bums playing in the NBA. But these guys have also been coached at a high level for the majority of their lives at this point because coaching has gotten better as an institution. You have, I mean, bigs learn how to do guard stuff now, right? At the grassroots, like everything has just changed. And I think that, uh, especially a guy like Franz, where he is so young, getting high level national team experience, I think is huge. Yeah, they're just better coach. They're better players. They're, you know, I mean, honestly, like technology is better. Having an iPad where I can, you know, I can get all my notes. And it's, here's the video I've cut for you, Franz, or Jalen. Hey, Jalen, look, man, you're, you're reaching out. You, when you're going left, you're reaching with your shooting hand to, to get the ball instead of pulling it to your shooting hand. Mm-hmm. Fix that. That sort of stuff. And I think Jalen's probably a guy you could say that to once, and it's fixed. That's well, the secret, by the way. You got to pull the ball to your shooting hand. Don't reach across your body. Or, or coach. Here, here were the calls that were missed in the first half. I'm going to put them on the laptop, and I'm going to have them loaded up for you in the presser in about two minutes. I don't think players are are, are actually loading up anything. I think this is uh, this is a top down situation. I would that would be hilarious. Hey, coach, uh, here's my tape uh, from tonight's game. Please take a look at it. To support the I like show, that idea, <laughs> check out patreon.com <laughs> slash thinking basketball. Uh, that's where we have our, our stats leaderboard that we use to research videos and podcasts like this one for players and teams. You can check out the Knicks and OG Ananobi and Jalen Brunson and all these stats we've referenced. Uh, thinking, thinkingbasketball.net, patreon.com slash thinking basketball for our top tier subscribers. Dave, how did it feel? How did it feel to uh, sit in that? Hot seat, and I'm so glad we got you excited about offensive rebounding, at least. I mean, I love offensive rebound. I mean, I love basketball, you know? So anytime I can talk basketball, strategy, you know, just general, it's always a good time. Man, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, I feel very free, though, because while Cody's going to be, you know, changing diapers or whatever, I, I'm going to go to the gym. <laughs> go spend some time with myself. I was going to ask you what you were going to do. You're going to get a little workout in? 
Oh yeah, for work, sure. Do you work on your shin angle? You know, it, it varies. I, if I hadn't if I hadn't done the World Cup this summer, my summer project was going to be trying to dunk again. When was the last time you dunked a basketball? It's been um, maybe 2011. Okay. All right, it's way, so, way, way ahead of me. And I'm 5'9", by the way. I'm just going to throw this out there. Like, this is not like, you know, former NBA player who's 6'8", and he's, you know, dunking every year. Cool, buddy. That's great. I, I'm proud of you, especially after the age of 50. Um, but, yeah, no, no, no. This is not an easy task. I can still get the rim, but, man, just getting the ball over the rim just isn't happening right now. Dave cannot believe that I can't grab the rim anymore. It's uh, Are, Yeah, you're like 6, what are you, 6'3", six, 6'2". Six, 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 two. Six two, okay. six, six two, and change depending on how long I've been standing. It's on the my feet. the hair throws yeah. me off, man. Yeah, well, that's why it's there. Yeah, yeah. but it doesn't <laughs> help. It turns out it doesn't help you dunk. And so I, if you rob a bank, they don't know how tall. They're I've like, I the don't know. They look like six arms. six. Yeah. Oh, see now that's yeah. the difference. See, I've got um, I have like a plus six wingspan. See, you have like probably longer arms than me. This is what's I, lost in the. This is this is actually twenty years ago, Dave. What turned me on to like functional. Functional height. Of player. Yeah, like I'm like I'm like that's fantastic that you're that tall because your neck is long. But um, what's your standing? We should reach? be measuring players to the shoulder. Yep. Mm-hmm. Give me wingspan. your stand, Give me your wingspan. Your standing wingspan reach. standing reach. Yeah. It's what? How tall are you actually? Right. Not how, where is your head? Right. I don't care where your eyes are. This is you know. This is why I I truly believe Victor Wembanyama is our first eight footer. Um, and uh, maybe in an upcoming episode I'll talk about that for forty five minutes because. Not sure if you've seen him play lately, but it's amazing. <laughs> is can I ask you uh, yeah. not to spoil anything? Yeah, I can't believe we haven't. We, this is the first time we podcast this since Victor Women has played an NBA game. He's like a top twenty player He's, already. I, this guy no is spoilers, insane, man. No spoilers. We can't he talk does, about this. He does something every game. I've just never thought about and. He is a curious player. Um, the the game against Embiid, where I first of all I love Embiid for this. I love Embiid for putting him under the basket at every opportunity, scoring set. That is that's basketball. I love that so much. Um, I also love that Pop just said, "Let's just do it. Let's see what happens. Go for it." There was a possession that stands out to me. Victor Wembanyama was posting up Embiid. Oh, and oh. for a player his age to have this sort of patience. Yes. I know the possession you're going to talk about. Is it end with a left hand? A left hand under Embiid's it's, it's arm. Unbelievable. It's like playing. It's like he's playing on a little tykes basket with children. And that's Joel Embiid, who's probably going to be the MVP this year. And that's different. Jo- Joel Embiid's and, not going to play enough games to win MVP this well, year. Well, you know but. what I mean. But... That was different. He doesn't get sped up. And also, he's got, not to, you know, sound like the internet, but he's got the dog in him. He wants to go at guys. Like, he has some Michael Jordan sort of, I want to kill this guy. And he's a rookie. All right. No more spoilers. It, it that's doesn't it. make any sense to that's, me. That's I'm having such a hard section. time with Victor Women. Yeah. Got to keep it in. Got to keep it in. Thank, thanks as always for listening uh, all the way through on this one. Dave, thanks so much for, for yeah. joining us. And of course, I hope you are having a great day.